So I, I, I really am truly uh, humbled to be here. I, I, uh, I, I am genuinely astounded by the, the human beings that have, have been on the stage, as I'm sure all of you are. Uh, it's part of why I woke up at 5 o'clock this morning with my heart beating. It has sort of accelerated ever since. Um, but, you know, just astounded by, by the people that have, that have been here. So um, I have sort of two hypotheses I want to uh, put to you today um, and to talk a little bit about sort of how I've come to them. Um, so the first hypothesis is that um, we have, even with the advances of the internet and the ability to reach the crowd, we have a, a, a sort of unfortunate layer of stuff, of consultants, administrators, managers, that are, that are sort of keeping us from revealing our full potential. Um, and I'm a consultant, so actually my mom sent me the cartoon. Uh, but, uh, but so, you know, I think whether it's Michael Scott or, you know, in all of our experiences, it's a boss, it's, a, it's an institution that we're in where we don't feel like we can drive change. There, there's, there's something wrong. We're, we've, we're too far from practitioners, from users, from the people closest to the problem. Um, the second hypothesis is that we have uh, taken something that I think um, is really illustrated by the people that have, that have been on the stage so far. But I think, I believe the universe is fundamentally good. And I believe the universe is fundamentally good because most people, uh, I think, believe in something similar to enlightened self-interest. The idea that, that pursuing what is good for me um, is also good for others, and caring for others is also good for me. And, and whether it's Dr. Doty, sort of talking about the health benefits, but there's, there's obviously lots to that. But for some reason, uh, and I don't know when this happened, I'm not a theorist, uh, we, we sort of yank those two things, that, yank that fundamental agreement apart into two much rarer things, which is pure evil um, or greed uh, and pure good. Uh, and I think that's, that, that's really not the harmony of the universe, and I think we're, we're kind of suffering for that. So those are the hypotheses. And then, so you might be thinking sort of, and I thought about, like, who, who is it, like, why, why, why do you have those opinions? Why should I listen to you? So I just want to talk a little bit about sort of how I've come to those. So, this is me. Um, I have not changed a lot from the image on the left, uh, including my upper body strength. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, you know, I'm a, I'm a happy person. I'm an optimist. I've been blessed with a tremendous amount of love, and um, and I really believe in in kind of goodness. And and I've I've been very fortunate in that. Um, uh, my parents actually similar, uh, really close to when this picture was taken. My parents were divorced, uh, and I was raised by my mom on the right. Uh, who you can sort of tell from the picture is also a really happy and optimistic person, um, despite the fact being a single mom. She's been a teacher for 35 years. Um, and she uh, in, uh, specifically is a science and math teacher for little kids. Um, and so in that capacity, she is always digging up worms. And you know she was teaching robotics before robotics was cool. And she's, she's basically trying to create the Eastons of the, of the future. Um, and, uh, and so sort of she built into me this, this same energy of sort of relentless, let's look at the new, let's stay positive. Um, and then in the middle is my fantastic and amazing wife, Danielle, uh, who um, uh, someone said yesterday, I think it was Howard, said that um, there is no such thing as the center of the universe anymore, which I think is absolutely true. Um, but, but Danielle is the center of my universe and, and sort of just is, sort of really keeps me uh, happy and healthy in, in who I am. So, so this is just who I am. I, there have been people on the stage who have incredibly powerful emotional stories. I've been really relatively fortunate in, in, in experiencing a lot of love and, and, and positivity. So I feel like then my job was to do something good. Um, so what to do? Uh, so first, um, I actually, uh, there's not a picture of this, but uh, my first kind of foray into work uh, which I refer, still refer to as my career. I don't know if that means I'm, I'm still like clinging to youth or, or if I just don't feel that serious about it. But my first step in my career uh, actually was doing community organizing in a township in uh, Cape Town, South Africa with 13 young people. So I, I really appreciate Saul the, the desire to have lots of young people on, on the stage here. Um, and then I moved to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. So this is a picture of the of the Rockefeller brothers, the generation younger than John Rockefeller Jr., um, who, you know, this is a family that invented philanthropy. Um, and so I had the incredible privilege of my first job working for Stephen Heinz, an amazing leader in philanthropy, uh, and really learning philanthropy from the people who invented it. Um, and I really have a deep and abiding love for that institution. I then, um, like any good millennial, I for some reason threw away the steady job, moved to San Francisco, and became a consultant. 
uh, which is a lot harder than I might have imagined. Uh, but I had the pleasure to work for a lot of organizations. Uh, really sort of the nonprofit sector is, uh, uh, as Paul Hawken calls it, sort of the immune system of humanity. It has an amazing uh, variety of types of organizations. And I got the opportunity to work with people, large and small, different issues, um, and really got to experience and see what it was like from the other side. So philanthropy is one of the most privileged places in the world, um, and uh, nonprofits are very much on the other side of that uh, bargain. So I got to see that. Then I came to good. Um, and so, and what attracted me to good was, I, I think in some ways, it is the epitome of a millennial organization. We're a little crazy, we change directions a lot, we're non-hierarchical, but I think at the fundamental level, the reason the brand has kind of persisted is that we hit on a nerve, which is that people don't want to separate their lives into, I do you know, bad during the day and, and I do, you know, do good in my free time, or if I want to do good, I have to live a, a sort of heroic, saintly existence but that they want to be able to bring those two things together, which is what Good is about. Um, good Core is a, a consulting uh, piece that has been part of Good for the last almost four years. And you know, I try to describe what it is. Really, sort of what we're like is the A-Team. I don't know if uh, a lot of you watch the A-Team. Not the movie, but the original. Um, but at the beginning, they say, if you need help and you can find them and no one else will help you, call the A-Team. So I think that's basically what we do. We don't, we don't do one thing. We, we just seem to dig in with people who are trying to make change, as Saul said, often within institutions, and try to help them make that change. So a couple examples of the work that we've done. The first was the Pepsi Refresh Project. Uh, Pepsi took $20 million that would have been spent on Super Bowl ads, uh, first time they were not in the Super Bowl in decades, and decided to give that away to people who were trying to make change in their communities. Um, pretty uh, incredible innovation uh, from a very large company. Uh, and instead then of you know, one time spend on a Super Bowl ad, we ended up with a, a thousand grantees. So these were individuals, nonprofits, and social enterprises, anybody who had an idea, put it up on the website and could generate uh, community support for their idea. And so we ended up with everyone from marching bands to pet rescues to uh, uh, music uh, programs in schools, kind of everybody. We even ended up with someone, this great guy, Calvin, who ran a tuxedo shop in Tennessee, and he wanted kids to be able to go to the prom who, uh, in a tuxedo who couldn't afford a tuxedo. So we, uh, we really had a pretty incredible impact. 80, uh, in the first year, actually, about 82 million votes, which is roughly about the amount that they voted in the presidential election that year. Um, so, so really a, a kind of massive thing. So I want to connect that back to the hypothesis, which is, first, we went to the people, right? So you know, I love philanthropy. I love the, the, the people who, who work really hard to make sure that we're making all the right decisions. But also, we just, we just sort of put that out to the crowd and said, hey, you pick. Um, and I think, sure, we ended up with some wacky findings. You know, people love pets. Uh, to sometimes an awkward degree, they love pets. Uh, so I, I might not uh, want that to be what we spend all our money on, but, but there's something really valuable about going to the people and, and, and erasing the distance between what uh, someone with a great idea and the ability to attract resources. And then I think on the other side, um, we, uh, we did this. This was a self-interested program. This was a marketing program by Pepsi. It was not a philanthropic program. And so that's why we could reach 4 billion earned media impressions. We give away $30 million a year at Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Not a single one of those grants got, a, got as much uh, press attention as the little grants. 5,000 bucks we were giving away with Pepsi Refresh. But they were getting two, three articles. They were on local news. They were on local radio because people were involved. Um, and so I think the, the self-interest that, that uh, is inherent in doing this as a marketing program was vital to its success and, and to having greater impact than possible. Because Pepsi spent 100 plus million dollars on top of the 20 million dollars integrating with NASCAR and MLB and celebrities and, and sort of getting the word out. And that's not something that we tend to do in, in kind of the social impact sector. So, so and, and I actually argue a lot of people talk about what, 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 whether Pepsi Resource was a success or a failure. Uh, it, the reason it didn't continue is in a way that it wasn't self-interested enough. That it was, it, we, Pepsi was not clear necessarily from the beginning that this had to drive sales and that they were in a tough business climate and that Wall Street wouldn't let them just kind of go off and innovate. Um, and so we didn't design a program that was built for sales. We designed a program that was built for long-term brand connection. Um, so I think that self-interest piece is deeply ingrained from the work we did on this. 
Um, the next one is uh, 100K in 10, so I think it connects exactly to this conference. This is an effort to bring 150 plus and counting different organizations from school districts to small universities to, uh, to big companies like Google who have a stake in making sure we have a workforce that's educated in, in STEM and that can, can continue to drive our economy forward uh, and bring those people to the table. This is also a story of, of, of a person, of, of Talia Milgram Elcott, who is a program officer at Carnegie, also a large institution, and is driving this change from inside. Um, and so to connect this to the hypothesis, we, um, we have really realized that you need everybody connected to an issue to be part of the solution to that issue. If you only get the, the employers at the table, or if you only get the, the universities or only the school districts, you're just going to get a piece of the puzzle. So this is an effort to bring to life what Saul was talking about. Let's get everyone who has a stake in this together. Um, and then on the self-interest side, it, it's, it's actually been kind of uh, surprising. Like true philanthropists, uh, the first to, uh, move to get people to collaborate was to give incentives. So small grants and other inducements to say, if you work together, we'll sort of reward that behavior. Interestingly, I think we're realizing that there's a lot of flaws in that. That really how you create it, as you again saw were, were saying earlier, is you create a higher vision and you call out of people that desire to, to do better, to, to reach for the stars. And I think that's where our, um, our work is headed now. Um, the next example is uh, Defend Paradise, which is an effort we're doing with the Nature Conservancy to essentially uh, create, without Bono and, and other high-level connections, a, a social brand. The, uh, and this is to try to entice the 40 million tourists a year who go to the Caribbean to uh, contribute to that, to that area's conservation because it's one of the most challenged environments uh, in the world. Uh, and again, the gentleman on the left, John Myers, is the deputy director of the Caribbean program, which is the smallest program at the Nature Conservancy, a very large organization. And he has single-handedly driven this vision within the organization. Um, and so uh, what we've learned here is we can't be afraid of consumers. If we can't get people who visit an area, 40 million people who visit an area because of its natural beauty to take a stake in protecting that natural beauty, then we're in real deep trouble as an environmental movement. So we better start by trying to think about, even if they're taking a cruise, right? Even if they're not environmental, how do we bring them into this? How do we make it fun? So there's a system of its products, its discounts, its experiences. How do we make this part of the, the kind of tourist experience? And then uh, we've also worked with a number of other companies. I, I think I'm, I'm sort of running low on time, but at all of these places, people are trying to take steps to do things differently um, and kind of, we, we are never hired by the CEO. We're always hired by lower level folks who see an innovation possible and want to drive that. Um, and we're also learning across all these projects that if there isn't self-interest on the part of the business or on the part of the, of the organization, it's just not sustainable. It won't last. Businesses can't keep writing big checks to unrelated nonprofits. They have to see some sort of return. And I would argue that issues and causes, things that we care about deeply, we're not making change on those in part because we're not engaging large numbers of people. And brands are terrific at that. They're really terrific at that. So we need to find those opportunities to connect. So just to back up again to sort of the themes I started with, I'm not claiming these are new. In some ways, they're the oldest things that exist. Um, if we look at like our ecosystems, right, that we're learning in science, everything is dependent on one another. You can't pull these things apart, whether it's quarks or, or, or ecosystems. It's, they're all deeply and, and uh, intimately connected. So, and in our families, in, in our lives, in our communities, it's the, it's the connections, it's that in life and self-interest that kind of holds us together. Um, and then also in the, the, the top right of, of the image there, that's Saul Alinsky. He created, he really innovated community organizing 50, 60 years ago. And at the, at the fundamental middle of that idea is the ability to find self-interest between people and communities and, and pull them together. Um, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville talked about it as self-interest properly understood. Dan Pink, uh, who was here last year, talks about it as the, the ability to convince someone to exchange what they have for what I have is fundamental to our uh, to our success and our survival. Um, so these are not new ideas, but for somehow, somehow we've, we've sort of lost it in the pursuit of social good. Um, and, and I just want to end by saying we're, you know, this isn't, we're, we're, we're 10, 12 people. Um, so we are just a, a, a kind of speck or a part of a broader movement that you all are all part of as well. Uh, people like Tom's, people like B Corp's, uh, Panera, you know, people that are experimenting and, and really trying to get us from uh, where we have been to, to where we're going. 
Um, and so I would just end by saying sort of, this is the first cover of good, blank like you give a damn, and, and I think all of you kind of represent that, but in, in your work when you kind of take this home, maybe it's thinking about are we really deeply trying to engage our users and our practitioners, and, uh, and are we really considering the self-interest of the people we're trying to reach in, in the work that we're doing? Thanks.